What is up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. This is Anthony. And this is James. And today we're going to do an episode of slavery in film, specifically doing the films Django Unchained and 12 Years a Slave. Since we're in Black History Month, we think it's important to tell some stories about black culture in America. And these are two of the, the best films made about slavery this century, maybe of all time. And I love them because Django and 12 Years a Slave, they're about slavery in America in the mid-19th century, but they have very different tones, whereas, you know, Django has, it's a Tarantino movie, so it has a lot of humor, uh, ultra-violent, but also that that sharp, witty dialogue that, that Tarantino writes, and then 12 Years a Slave is an intense, emotional, draining drama. Yeah, I mean, you have two of the greatest filmmakers working today, Steve McQueen and Quentin Tarantino, and for anyone who doesn't know Steve McQueen very much, he, he also did Hunger, he did Shame, um, and he did Widows. He's an absolutely fantastic director, and he's easily one of the t- most talented filmmakers working right now. And he is a, a true artist. All of his films are extremely impactful and deep and meditative, and he does, he does the same with this film. So it's really great to talk about these two films in particular because uh, slavery films, they, they're, they're always very important. But to see the t- stories told with completely different perspectives and takes on the idea of a slavery movie— um, I think it's just uh, really fascinating to see how these two filmmakers differ. Yeah, and I, I like how you pointed out that Steve McQueen is such an artistic director. And these both these directors, both these guys are tours, which we don't use that term very often, but we use it for very specific filmmakers because they deserve that term. And Steve McQueen, he spent uh, several years plugging away at making short films and video shorts until he finally got his, his break with Hunger, which was a... Uh, a film that he made with his frequent collaborator, Michael Fassbender. They kind of both like helped each other make their careers in a way. Like they they uh, mm. uh, collabed on their first few films together. And Hunger follows Fassbender playing an Irish prisoner on and who leads a hunger strike in prison. It's based on a true story. And then in Shame, he plays a sex addict and how that life affects him. And I think we would have heard a lot more about Steve McQueen years sooner with Shame specifically because. If Shame didn't get the NC-17 rating that it did, I think it would have been up for a lot of nominations. Shame was my favorite movie of that year. 2011. Yeah, it was an absolutely fantastic film. And Quentin Tarantino, as we've talked about with Inglourious Bastards, and it's something he did again with Once Upon a Time with Hollywood, where uh, he likes to play around with history. He is very authentic, and he obviously did a lot of research, and he is uh, very uh, and he's very accurate in a lot of ways, especially... Uh, with the depiction of slavery in this film. I saw a lot of things that I never knew about in this movie. Um, So he clearly educated himself, but the same thing he did with Inglorious Bastards, the same thing Once Upon a Time, is he likes to play with history, and he likes to shake things up where, yeah, just because something happened in the past doesn't mean I can't tell a fictitious story set in that environment, but in my own way and have fun with with it. So uh, in this film, he, he pretty much takes the the slavery story, and he turns it into uh, the classic Western hero story where Django starts out as a slave and he becomes the classic hero figure, which is a fantastic take on the story. The best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast, and become a patron where you get special perks like behind-the-scenes peaks at upcoming episodes, personalized messages, and personalized video messages, as well as top-tier patrons get a monthly shout-out on the podcast, which we will do at the end of this episode. Top-tier patrons, stay tuned to the very end. Yeah, Django and Chain might be the best Western made this century. It's up there with yeah. like No Country for Old Men, True Grit. So there there have been like a handful Her, yeah. of very good Westerns, but Django might be might be top of the charts with it. It's all his also his first true Western. Yeah. Because you could say Kill Bill is a Western. In a way, in yeah. In a way. But yeah. it's it's not quite like the period piece Western that we're used to seeing when we think of a Western. I compare Kill Bill more to like those samurai films, so yeah. which are also very Western in a way. Mm-hmm. And then, but yeah, in terms of a spaghetti Western, straight up spaghetti Western, Django and Chain might be the first one we've seen done like those old spaghetti Westerns in a long time, like classic one-liners and these these classic heroic stories of the, of these heroes. And I think that Django. I, for some reason, as part of me wants to say that it's underrated because I think it has a, a kind of a smaller audience compared to his other films because I think a lot of people are put off by the ultra violence in it, and also he got he came he comes under fire from critics with this movie specifically because of the excessive use not just of the violence that he shows but also the use of the n word which he uses a lot in this film and I think with Quentin Tarantino, um, a lot of people might call him a racist director but I think that. He keeps words like that in, and he keeps themes like that in these films on purpose because, like you said, he's telling history in a way. Obviously, it's a fictitious story, 
but historically accurate. The dialogue is probably toned down ex- exceptionally from Mississippi in 1958, I think the movie takes place. Yeah, and um, if you're going to tell a story set in that environment, they ha- the characters have to speak the way they would have spoken. And I think that people with Tarantino, they have a problem with him, not so much, yeah, with this film, but especially with Pulp Fiction because the character Jimmy he plays actually says the N-word a few times. Yeah. And so I think that's where that spark of people being uh, uh, and people not liking Tarantino for that reason, that's where it started. Whereas this is a completely different thing, and that's you can have a definitely have a discussion about that. Whether, yeah, I understand yeah, that for Pulp Fiction for that. sure. It's different with Django, but with this, it's it's uh, it's set in Mississippi in the South pre Civil War. So obviously the N word has to be used often because it was used often. And uh, the thing is, uh, what I love about Tarantino, and you pointed this out when we did the Tarantino episode, and I never thought about it this way, is that he likes to take victims of history, and he likes to make them. Um, the people who carry out the violence on their previous, um, uh, on, on the people who dominated them in the history. So the Jews in Inglorious Bastards hunt Nazis. And, and in this film, a slave ends up uh, killing slavers, killing um, evil white people, and becoming pretty much a hero in the black community in this film. And yeah, so, yeah. like, again, with that victim changing, turning the tables. I think I worded it that he takes the oppressed uh-huh. and and makes them the oppressors that's of it. who oppresses them or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. that's one of my favorite parts of this film is obviously, again, I think when we're talking about Westerns, if you think about, think of your favorite Western movies, like, I mean, Unforgiven and, and movies like that, or or even uh, the, the, the Dollar Trilogy. Slavery is usually ignored or barely touched on. You you seldom see slaves. Yeah. You se- they seldom talk about. It. They'll talk about the Civil War in these westerns, but they never really get to the to the truth about slavery. And I think that that's why Django Unchained, despite how violent and and maybe offensive some people might find the movie, it's historically important to watch. And it was an important film to be made. And also, it's like in in terms of it being historically important, it's because of what he did with the character of Django and the idea of what a slave character could be rather than just being an oppressed slave, because uh, Tarantino pretty much turned Django into a superhero in this movie. He is the superhero for the black community in this film, and you can even see the reactions of the other black characters as they watch him talk to Calvin Candy and the other white men in this film like no other black person has spoken to white people before. And And Tarantino gives him a lot of superhero attributes, like he has his own theme song, he, ha- he does that great hero stance before he kills the first brittle brother. And he's just standing with the blue, blue outfit, and there's that great pushing of the camera. It's a, like a classic hero pose, and he turns the whip on the slaver and whips the slave and whips the slaver. He, I like he, the way you die, boy. I like the way you die, boy. Like when he pulls out the gun and shoots the brittle brother, it's, it's amazing. And, and he kills a bunch of white slavers in this movie, so in a lot of ways he becomes... A black superhero in this film. He kind of even has his own black superhero outfit. Like obviously he has that blue and white uh, outfit that I think that I think Tarantino's kind of making fun of the concept of white aristocracy at the time. And it's also a reference to a famous painting. Yeah, and also, but then eventually Django gets that cool green jacket, the cool hat, the sunglasses, and yeah. this is like his new persona that he is. As like you just said, he could be a superhero. And Jamie Fox was perfectly cast in this movie. I couldn't think of another actor that could do a better job. And the reason for that is because Jimmy Fox is already a cowboy. He's owned a ranch for years. He's been riding horses for years. He is like this character already. And that's why I think when Tarantino uh, met with him about this film, he felt right for the role because Tarantino originally wrote Django Unchained with Will Smith in mind. And they met a couple of times about the story. And Tarantino, obviously being a big fan of Will Smith, wanted him as Django but Will Smith had one big problem with the script. He didn't like how Calvin Candy was killed by Schultz and not by Django. So Will Smith was like, I'll do the movie, but I want to be the one that kills the villain at the end. I want to be the hero because he didn't feel like Django was the, the real lead if he didn't kill the villain. And then Tarantino stuck to his guns and he's like, this is my script. This is how I'm writing the ending. And Schultz is going to be one that, the one that kills Candy in the end. And so um, they couldn't agree to terms about that ending. And so Will Smith passed on the project. And then next up, uh, um, Tarantino met with Jamie Foxx. And I think it ended up working out for them. Yeah, and I think that I agree with when I could agree. I could see both sides, but I think it's important for the character of Schultz to to do this at the end and take Candy out. Because even though the, the thing about this climax at the end, it's kind of like the movie could just be over. They they get Brumhilda, mm. um, even though their, their plan's been 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 figured out. And they just walk away, but it's important for for Schultz to 
to, to kill Candy because Schultz, despite getting what he needed and getting what he wanted and helping Django and getting Bermilda freed from Candy, he just can't let this person keep living, this horrible, evil character, Calvin Candy, who is such a terrific villain, and, and we'll talk about him in a little bit. And I think that's one of the great character traits of of Schultz is he sacrifices himself because he knows he's going to die when he does it to kill Calvin Candy for like kind of like a selfish satisfaction in a way. Yeah, it's, it's a, it comes out of self-righteousness and, and justice as well because uh, Schultz, ha- Schultz is a, a morally good character. Yes, he's a bounty hunter. Yes, he kills people. Um, and obviously, obviously like that uh, that farmer on the ranch that they kill, they snipe out. Obviously, like that guy was unarmed, and but still he's a wanted man. So the men he kills are criminals. And, and Calvin Candy, you could say he's not a criminal per se, but... He is the most vile, evil person that Schultz has ever encountered, and and I think that Schultz had to do it, and for Django to do it, it probably wouldn't have felt right in terms of him just straight up cold blood murdering someone, because he's the hero, and so I think Schultz had to be the one to be. Like, I'm gonna kill this person in cold blood because that's what they deserve. You know, you saying that right now, that kind of makes me think that that Schultz kind of reminds me of Ford in 12 Years a Slave. And so Ford is played by Benedict Cumberbatch, and yeah. he's he's the, the first plantation owner that, that um, Solomon Kane is sent— I mean, <laughs> that Solomon Northup is sent to after he's sold into slavery. And Ford is different than the slavers that Solomon experiences who are very violent and aggressive and beat him constantly and, and dehumanize him. Whereas Ford, like, he's kind of like Schultz where he is, he has morals, he has ethics, but at the same time, both of these characters, Schultz and Ford, they take part in uh, a legal act that is horrible. It's, yeah. it's a inhumane thing to do to have slaves to to keep slaves and to you know purchase slaves and they both in their films purchase slaves i mean schultz as great as he is he does purchase Django, and he does use that relationship as leverage to help him out and, and ford does the same thing and although ford you know he gives him the fiddle to play and he tries to humanize him um and he treats him better than the other people he at the same time it, it questions like just because you have morals that you believe something is wrong, but if you still do it, despite it being a legal activity, does you does that make you a good person or a bad person? I think in the end, Ford is a bad person, but I think what Schultz does at the end of the film is he redeems that bad morale that he would morality that he would have from having a slave. That's a, that's a great point, and Ford does redeem himself a little bit by saving uh, Solomon's life and then selling him to save him from Paul, Paul Dano's character. But you're right. Ultimately, he he is a bad person because he owns people. But I think Schultz actually redeems himself earlier in the film after Django's debt is paid to him and all three brittle brothers are killed. And he learns about Django's wife and his uh, desire to save her. Schultz decides to join him. He could have just go on his way and leave Django and just they both live their lives. But Schultz decides he's going to put his life at risk to save Django's wife because he feels... A sense of responsibility towards Django and a kinship towards him, and so I think that's the redeeming factor that Schultz has. Not before, way before he kills Calvin. Oh right, yeah, I can see that. And he also says something about like the German in him has to help him on his journey to save his princess. Yeah, to reference that, yeah, that yeah. old folk, folk tale. tale. And obviously, we're gonna be chilling on Django and Chain for this first part of the episode. And it came out in 2012, written and directed by Quentin Tarantino, uh, which he got an Oscar for best screenplay. And With the help of a German bounty hunter, a freed slave sets out to rescue his wife from a brutal Mississippi plantation owner. It's funny, like, Tarantino is kind of like LeBron James, where it's like, he can win the MVP every year. And, like, every time Tarantino writes a script, he should win the Oscar. But he doesn't doesn't always. And when he won this one, I'm like, okay, finally he won the Oscar again. Yeah, because he hadn't won it since Pulp Pulp Fiction. Fiction And he's never even won a a Best Oscar for Director. Director. And I, I think he's only been nominated once for Director, if that. I think twice for director for Pulp right. Fiction and, and Glorious Bastards. But it's still crazy to think that it, it, this was his second Oscar, and how he's never won director is mind blowing. And then, but you think about it, Martin Scorsese he didn't win his Oscar for best director until The Departed. I mean, that's forty years after he started his career. And then we're talking about Nolan didn't get a nomination until Dunkirk. So these <laughs> crazy. These are some incredible all time talent directors who never got nominations or recognition for directing until later on in their careers, much later in their careers. Yeah, it's this weird thing. It's this combination of like whatever's hot that year. In terms of like the themes of the Oscars and, and politics and social, economic, social political stuff. And also like 
uh, if there's a great like a great film up against another really great filmmaker and like like Alfonso Cuarón beat out Steve McQueen for best director over yeah. 12 years of slave because he made Gravity and it's like you can't kind of argue with that because Gravity is such an amazingly directed film and so things like that happen where it's like so it can be bad timing I think as well as like whatever's going on that year politically yeah in terms of the politics of hollywood yeah hollywood loves a narrative and usually every year the awards are are, are based off narratives which yeah. is it is what it is yeah all awards are like that but django is a phenomenal film it deserved to get the recognition it got critically and imdb user ratings has it number 55 for an audience rating of all-time films so people love this movie and i understand why i mean i've seen it six or seven times and it blows me away every time and i, I kind of feel like i i learn new things every time i watch it because like it's kind of like when you watch tarantino movies they're almost like reading books because you can read a book a few times over and over again you get something different out of it because his his movies are kind of like novels in a way because they're they're usually very long uh they're very detailed the the dialogue is very articulate and very well thought out and, and very well planned, and the acting is always phenomenal. And in like this novelis, novelistic strain, for me, I think makes that's what makes Quentin Tarantino such an ambitious filmmaker. And combine that with he always knows where he wants to have the camera, and I think he's just one of the greatest directors to ever do it. And it's especially prevalent in his last half of his career, where Tarantino his voice comes out in. In his uh, love of film, especially in films like this where he'll have all the themes and ideas and things of that you see in famous westerns from the 50s and 60s and he throws them into this, whether it's like Ennio Morricone's score or some of the uh, songs that he plays and the way he shoots certain scenes and showing certain out like landscapes of America and he and like black exploitation music and he throws in these these things that he loves about old movies and he just piles in these references into this hodgepodge of his own little story. And I, I think that's, that's what makes a Tarantino a Tarantino movie is his love of cinema is so visible in his movies. Yeah. And the music, like you just talked about in this movie is exceptional because he, he obviously uses a bunch of stuff from Morricone, uh, rest in peace, great Italian composer who you'd recognize everything he's ever done and then he also uses a lot of modern rap and a lot of modern like rock music yeah. like gary contemporary Clark Jr., music yeah the uh the alabama shakes and jamie fox made a song with another rapper i forget his name real quick um but it's, it's kind of like when i watch peaky blinders it's really this cool aesthetic where you have this setting of like a, of something centuries ago of, of a story centuries ago but then you use modern music and it brings a, a new aesthetic to the story because like i said this is very much a spaghetti western he could have gone that route with all the music being like that too but instead you bring this new music and you have a new vibe to the spaghetti western it's like a revival of the genre yeah and uh, uh not to mention tarantino has an amazing death scene in this movie yeah <laughs> he, blew he gets blown up. up by dynamite i can't tell if he's like making fun of himself like that i think he's just having like, i think it's just a joke because when you saw him show up and you saw his, i think the whole audience was like oh, it's tarantino <laughs> It's funny because both these films, 12 Years a Slave and Django, have insane cameos. Obviously, Tarantino and then Brad Pitt in 12 Years a Slave. And both these cameos took me out of the films for a moment because I, I know that look you're giving me. You're like, but Brad is the best. No, I'll tell you why. I love Brad Pitt so much, but I think his cameo, he has he's such gravitas and he has such star power that it kind of takes you out of this amazing story that Steve McQueen crafted with the with the screenwriters and, and filmmakers and producers. And I know he's a producer of the film and Plan B. He wants to be in the movie. But I think for me, it, it takes me out of it for a moment because every Everyone else is mostly unrecognizable. I mean, Lupita, that was her first film role. I knew Chiwetel from a bunch of films, but this was his first leading role. Everyone else was kind of just minor characters, obviously Paul Giamatti and Benedict Cumberbatch. But I mean, I saw Brad Pitt, and I'm like, he's he's too big of a star to be in that role, I think. I agree with you, but that's he didn't he's he's not in the movie because he wanted to be. He's in the movie to help them get funding. Okay. So th they weren't getting enough funding. They the the other producers on the that they were trying to get on the film to give them money, they weren't quite sold worried about it getting a profit so then when he then he was like okay what if i act in the third act of the film i'll be in it and that gave them the mo enough money to actually make the movie so he's in the movie in order to get it made that actually reminds me of i think there was a story where in italy they had yeah. uh posters up in billboards of 12 years a slave 
but for the images they had Brad Pitt and I think probably Michael Fassbender or Benedict Cumberbatch Fassbender. on the poster without Chiwetel and and um obviously that got the media in a storm because it is a I think that's an insane slight to do to Chiwetel and to the story and to Steve McQueen because they did it because they, they said that Chiwetel isn't well known in Italy but still he's a star of the film yeah and it looks like the a racist, minor characters. It, it looks racist to take him out of that over the promotion of the film and if you see the poster you look at uh, anyone listening search it for it online it's literally a poster and, and uh, there are two posters there's one with Fast Bender and one with Brad Pitt and the poster is the same kind of style and they're both just gigantic heads on the poster with um, Chiwetel tiny running on the bottom of the poster. And so it's just like Brad Pitt's face on the entire poster. In, and it says 12 years a slave. Brad Pitt's in one scene. He's in two scenes. Well, two scenes, but yeah. like one part of the, yeah, yeah. like one day. One sequence. Yeah. yeah. So that, that reminded me of that real quick. So yeah, obviously that was horrible marketing, but Brad Pitt didn't want to act in it. He had to. And he funded it, and that's why he was on stage accepting the award for best picture. He's the, fir he's the first credited producer on the film. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure he put up a lot of stake on this film, and he's probably one of the main reasons that it got made because I'm sure a lot of people. I mean, period pieces are tough to get made, and they require a lot of funding, and they don't always have the biggest audiences. But I think Steve McQueen's talent as the director really made this. Is he could be the most famous director by name could living. Be. But his movies don't make a ton of money. They make good money, but they don't make a huge return. Like, this film was his biggest um, success at the time. Um, but before this, like, his movies, they might make $100 million domestic, maybe. I think this made, like, 140 that's it. Yeah, yeah. So On a $100 million budget. Yeah. But that's domestic. Yeah. It made it made enough overseas to make a budget, to make a uh, profit. But that's the thing is, like, his movies just barely break even. You know what I mean? So his movies are a lot riskier for producers to fund because of the way he shoots in terms of everything's film. There's no CGI. He wants everything, all the sets built. The production design is design is top notch. Like everything is as tangible as possible, and that's expensive. He doesn't like using green screens at all, and so I don't think he's. I can't think of any time he's. I used doubt a green he's screen, ever using green screen, except for maybe the plane sequence in Kill Bill when it's flying in the sky. Yeah, maybe. that might be CGI, but yeah. I can't think of CGI in Tarantino movie besides that. And we talk about Nolan not liking CGI, but Tarantino hates CGI and so that's why oftentimes his movies will have bigger budgets because of that but again I think another reason why he's not a huge box office draw I mean he's makes, he makes three hour long movies not yeah. a lot of people want to go see a three hour movie yeah. we'll go see a five hour movie I don't give a F yeah. I'll go watch like the Lord of the Rings eight hour versions <laughs> of them no problem so, we saw the Dark Knight trilogy yeah, in one night back to back at, to at back AMC, so yeah so I have no problem with that but on top of that so I think that and people also know they're ultra violent yeah and there's going to be really bad language and there are a lot of like uh, very, uh, there are a lot of like older people who don't want to see films with bad language or a lot of violence. So that eliminates a huge portion of the audiences. So uh, I, he's obviously found his audience, but it's not as big as like a Chris Nolan audience. Yeah, and he has such a devout fan base that I think obviously everyone in the industry, everyone interested in film, at some point will watch all of his movies. They do at some point, whether it's on VOD or or they rent it at some point. So his movies will always get seen, and will his movies will be seen forever. So he's he cemented himself with a legacy of of a top 10, 15 filmmaker of all time. And Django, it's it's one of his top five films probably. And, and the, the cast in this movie is phenomenal. I mean, we have such great performances from obviously Jamie Foxx is great as Django. He's ultra charismatic. He's his, he's hilarious. Do you I, know the story of Tarantino and, and, J, and yeah, uh, yeah. Jamie Foxx? Yeah, on uh, rehearsals. Yeah, so they were doing the first table read. And when Jamie Foxx started saying his first lines of dialogue, he was talking like cool like Django does in the second half of the film. And then Tarantino had to pull him aside into a separate room, and he was like, "What the hell are you doing?" He's like, "What are you doing?" And, J and Jamie Foxx is like, "I'm I'm acting. I'm 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 being Django." He's like, "You're a slave. You can't talk like that. You're you're a slave. You have to talk like a slave." And that's where Tarantino is so brilliant, where he understands the character because I'm sure Jamie Foxx is like, "This is a western. I'm gonna play it like a western hero." Yeah, I'm gonna be Clint Eastwood yeah. right now. But Django goes on a journey, and uh, and he becomes Django, the hero. But first, he starts out as a slave, and a slave obviously wouldn't talk like that and then once he gains power in his life and he's freed then he starts talking like the cool heroic Django and that's something where Tarantino probably knows the characters better than actors ever do yeah and Django again once he gets to that point even when he's still in slave he's still very charismatic and yeah um Django ironically the character has to act throughout the film so so he has to put on the show, which King Schultz explains to him, like they're they're playing a role to get into Candy's circle and to get Candy's trust and to 
carry out their plan. And and Django, he has a very high IQ for a character, but you can just tell he's never been able to use it. And I think this is shown specifically when Django is antagonizing Candy when they're on their journey to Candyland. And Schultz takes him aside and he's like, what are you doing? Have you lost sight of what we're doing? You keep antagonizing Candy. And then Django's explaining to him, I'm not antagonizing him. I'm intriguing him. So Django is kind of operating in an intellect similar, similar to Schultz, who's a very smart person in this film. You can tell by his language. And it's something that he's probably never been able to do his entire life because uh, Schultz is obviously the first white person who's ever spoken to Django like a human being. Like in the first act of the film after Schultz um, uh, takes Django from the, the slave traders and he brings him to that uh, small western town and they get that beer, you, just the look on Jamie Foxx's face, you can, he does a great job acting this where he's like in kind of disbelief and amazement like that this white man is like talking to him like this and, and pours him a beer and sits down at a table with him like they're equals. Let's him ride a horse. Let's him ride a horse. And it's like, you can see that look on his face where Django's like, who is, like, what's going on? And it's like the first step to him becoming Django is being accepted by Schultz as an equal. So Schultz is such an important character in this film. Yeah, and he's the dentist turned bounty hunter, and he speaks English better than most of the Native Americans, despite <laughs> it being his second language, he explains. Speak it in English. And, and language is a really important part of this film that I think Tarantino wants to just kind of flip on its head. Like, we're always taught that slaves were never taught good English, and uh, they didn't speak very well English, and all all of their owners obviously did. But really, he flips it on the head where half of these slavers... They, they just mumble crap out of their mouths, and you can barely ever even understand what they're saying, whereas all the slaves actually speak very well. Yeah, and it's it's so funny because Schultz has um, a better understanding of the English language than most of the other people in this film. Yeah. And they're all Americans. And they're all like, speak English. He's like, oh, I wish to parlay. <laughs> Ascertain. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I, I think about halfway through this film, once DiCaprio shows up, it kind of becomes the Calvin Candy show. Yeah, absolutely. And he just dominates the screen. And I don't understand how he did not gotten, did not even get a nomination for this movie. It's absolutely insane. Uh, this is DiCaprio's at his finest. And he plays such a despicable, vile, evil character. And his performance as Calvin Candy really takes over the film. Because once Django is uh, freed and he becomes like a the true version of himself... Uh, now he has to go up against the villain of the film, and we don't see the villain villain until over an hour into the movie. Yeah, I think the Academy just doesn't want to reward that kind of character. That's just my two cents because Leonardo's role as Calvin Candy is probably his best performance. It's it's insane yeah. what he did on camera, um, and it's a first. It's the first movie in a long time that he accepted that he wasn't the lead character. That you know he hasn't done that since or he was top a kid. billing. Yeah, top billing or lead character. I mean, Tarantino like got top billing. Yeah, so it's nuts. So um, I think Leonardo understood how big the role could have been if he took it and, and took it very seriously, which he did. And Calvin Candy is one of the most evil characters we've ever seen on film, and kind of like Django. And Schultz are playing a role. Calvin Candy plays a role himself. Like he thinks he's like this very sophisticated, important person. Intelligent. In he think, yeah, he thinks he's intelligent. He's obsessed with France and th and thinks he's part of that culture. But he he can't speak a word of French, and it's kind of like part of his personality to push on this person, this this facade of sophistication and. Leo, again, he plays two roles where he's playing Calvin Candy pretending to be this impressive person to help to win, win people's opinions about him. And then he plays the real Calvin Candy, which we don't see. It finally comes out when he finds out the plot from, from Steven and he brings out the skull to the, di to the dinner table at dessert. That's when we finally see the real Calvin Candy. That's a great point. And DiCaprio hadn't played a villain since um, The Man in the Iron Mask. And even in that movie, he, still play he played the protagonist, too, because yeah. he played twins. So he still played uh, the lead. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> no, you find out pretty quickly. And Calvin is such a fascinating character because he's a villain that he didn't become a villain. I, I would say that he was born as a villain because imagine his life growing up, the son of, of slave owners and... He was probably a despicable child. You know what I mean? Yeah, I wouldn't say he was born he, like born as a villain. Not, he became he, be, he, he became was, a villain from his environment. Yeah, from his environment. But um, I would say he was a, he was probably a villain when he was a little kid. Is what oh, I mean. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, he and, grew up on a plantation. I think yeah. there's that line that he says where he's like, 
all my life I've been surrounded by black faces. So yeah. all he's known is slaves, and he's treated them like scum of the earth. And since he was a child, he has exerted power and dominance over these adults just because they're black and he's white. And so imagine what that does to, to someone like that. It just has uh, corrupted his soul, you know what I mean, completely. And that's what's turned him into this ruthless, maniacal villain. But he's also got these weaknesses, like, uh, in these fun ticks, like, he, he's drinking that coconut shake with a giant straw at the Mandingo fight, and Tarantino throws in these, like, funny, bizarre contrasts with the character, and, and there are a lot of, uh, r- there are a few really great sugar metaphors in this film in terms of Calvin Candy. Um, first of all, he loves eating candy. He's always eating, like, kinds of candies, and he's having that sweet rum drink at the Mandingo fight. And so all the sugar he takes, he ingests, it causes his teeth to rot. And if you look at this film, DiCaprio's teeth are just disgusting looking. Yeah. And sugar connects four different things in the plot. So uh, Calvin is rotting from the inside, like his teeth are rotting because of his evil nature. And then Dr. King Schultz is a dentist, and he has shown up to get rid of the cavity. And Calvin is the cavity in humanity. And then Calvin's farm is named Candyland. And then sugar is one of the main crops harvested by the slaves. Uh, during one of the dinner scenes, I think it was actually one of the first scenes that Leo shot, he had to stop the scene and like try to talk to, to Jamie Foxx in the side because he, he had a difficult time saying all these racial slurs. And then, you know, Jamie Foxx is like, hey, man, it's because you're human. You know, this isn't comfortable for you. And, you know, this is just acting. But Sam L. Jackson's like... Mother effort, this is just another Tuesday for us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that it'd be, I've, I don't think I've ever said that word, but I mean, I think it'd be difficult to say that if I was an actor over and over and over again for yeah. hours and hours when you spent your whole life as it, a, a word for a white person to say that. It's, it's a very offensive thing to do. And so we've known it to be basically a tabooed word that we should never say. And then to have to say it for hundreds of times every day, it's, it's, I'm sure it's intense. Yeah, and even though they're play acting, like he's screaming it at, these other people and i'm sure that was obviously very difficult to do i'm sure i can only imagine and and i love the relationship between calvin and steven in this movie because we don't learn i mean the thing a good thing about tarantino he doesn't love doing too much exposition and like people won't tell you their life story so we don't really know anything about steven but we know that he is the house slave and he's good at it and steve just explain what a house slave is a house slave is like the number one slave of the entire plantation and um, in this case, uh, Stephen has been the house slave for what seems like decades and is the, the only um, black person that Calvin will kind of speak to as an equal. He's kind of an enforcer it, yeah. of the other slaves, and too. He, so, and Stephen is great at surviving, and the reason, that's why he is a perfect house slave, because he is a survivor. So he'll happily rat out another slave to get them in trouble or, or force them to be punished or even killed. So uh, there's a, and people often say that, uh, the the most despicable kind of black person is like probably the house slave or or a black slaver. Those are pr- the probably the two con- worst kinds of black people in movies. And uh, Sam Jackson was a little hesitant to play this character at first because uh, he's like Tarantino. You're asking me to play the most hated black character in all of cinema. But he, I think, for someone like him, because people love Sam Jackson so much, he can pull off a role like this, and it doesn't change anyone's opinion about him or look at him in any other way. Uh, and he's such a great actor. I think that this is his greatest performance. Yeah, uh, I don't think Samuel would do the movie if he didn't believe in the material and believe in Tarantino as a filmmaker. And I, I think Steven's such an interesting character because he he reminds me of the slave in 12 Years a Slave who he's, she's the older woman and she married the plantation owner. Yeah. And she's kind of like that similar status where it's it's almost breaching on the point in this world where you're in that white society culture now. And I think Steven, that's why he, he hates, that's why he hates Django so much is that he spent his entire life uh, being horrible and vicious to all these other slaves to get in every day more trust with Calvin Candy and more in Calvin Candy's favor to be at the role he's in as being the house slave and being staying in the big house. And that's why he's like, he's staying in the big house? How come he gets to stay in the big house? Because yeah. Steven spends his whole life trying to get into the big house and Django's there for the first time and he gets to stay in the big house. And you, that's a great point because the moment that Steven sees Django riding on that horse, he glares at him. He's like, "What is? who is this guy? So you're right, he... I didn't think of it that way. That's a that's a great point. And Stephen, even though he and Calvin have a very close relationship, they're not very public about it because around other people, um, they'll bicker and like play around and, and, and like joke around with each other. But uh, Stephen still, if Calvin gets upset or orders him to do something, he still 
like obeys. And there's a point where he's arguing about Django staying in the big house, and then Calvin eventually yells at him, and he's like, oh, yes, sir, absolutely. But that's just his persona in front of other people. And we finally get to see what this relationship really is like when they both go into the library for that private discussion where Steven reveals that he thinks that Django and Schultz are trying to trick um, uh, Calvin into buying these two slaves. And we see when Calvin walks into the room, it's this amazing shot where, where Steven is just li- sitting back on an armchair with a glass of cognac in his hand. And he's, he even like kind of like patronizes Calvin and talks down to, to Calvin in a lot of uh, moments in the scene. And it's a great, fascinating look at this character because when it's just the two of them, uh, Steven in, in some ways has uh, power in their relationship. And he seems to be like kind of like a, a wise father figure. And you can imagine that Steven uh, probably had a big part in raising Calvin. Yeah, he raised him his whole life. Yeah. And that's such a great point to bring up because like we talked about, Django plays a role. Uh, King Schultz is playing a role to get into Candyland and Candy's favor. Um, uh Candy, Calvin Candy plays a role, being the sophisticated person he thinks he is. Um, Brumhilda plays a role at some point when she's in on the plan, and Steven has been playing this role his whole life to get into Calvin Candy's favor favor as well. So everyone in this film is kind of playing two characters and playing characters that are playing characters. And, and he's even doing the fake limp. Yeah, the fake limp. And uh, he's pretending to be frail. Yeah, so that makes him seem weak, and he drops that immediately when he's alone with Django, and Django's When all the white up. people are dead. Yeah, so yeah, yeah basically, and then, and then Steven's just walking around normally, and he has massive influence over Candy, like you just said. He has this power in their relationship. And because I think Calvin, deep down, he knows that he's not that intelligent, because uh, I can't remember what word Schultz says, but um, Schultz says some word, and then... Um, Steven asks what Calvin what it means, and Calvin's like, "Yeah," and he just like kind of gestures back to Schultz to say what the word means. So Calvin, in a lot of ways, isn't as intelligent as the other characters in the film. Also, when Schultz points out that Alexandre Dumas was actually part black, even though Calvin is a big fan of his writing. Yeah, and to stay on Steven for a second, I think that he recognizes that Django. And Schultz are putting on an act. I think he recognizes that Brumhilda is putting on an act real quickly because he's been putting on an act his whole life. So he knows how people who are faking things are spo- look like. So, I mean, he's, he's got to be 60 years old. He's been doing it for, his, for 50 years probably. And you can see the nonverbal clues of acting and the and the nervous nature, the the dialogue, the way they talk. And he, I think that's how he so easily sniffs out this master plan behind Candy's back. And I think the, the, the biggest clue for him was... When um, when Calvin's sister points out that uh, Broomhilda has eyes for Django, meaning that like they were looking at each other a lot, she thinks like, oh, she just has a crush on him. But for Steven, he immediately recognizes that as a sign that they probably know each other, and that's why they've been staring at each other. Because when he looks at Broomy, she has that shocked face and is trying to hide it. Yeah, and Kerry Washington's phenomenal as Broomhilda, and she she goes through a lot in this movie. I mean, she she takes whippings in this movie. She's in that hot box out in the sun. So she physically, I'm sure, went through a lot for this. There's role. even there's a rape scene they deleted too. Yeah, and um, she's all she is in a lot of intense environments like a lot of slaves were put into. Again, this is this is Tarantino, and like we'll talk about with Steve McQueen, they don't want to hide the true nature of what slavery was like, and we we learn that from through Broomhilda because mostly we're following Django after he's was a slave and and once he's taken from by, by king schultz and then the, the interesting thing about from hilda and django's love stories aren't exactly like tarantino's forte obviously he wrote true romance but generally speaking you know these love sto- classic love stories aren't things that he writes into scripts and it's it's actually really nice to see in this movie with with all the violence and everything and I, it also gives django other motivations other than just enacting revenge you know he, his heart is in this journey yeah, and so that's actually different for a Tarantino movie because it's not a revenge story. It's just, it's a rescue movie. And uh, want to hear something really cool about Broomhilda? Oh, sure I do. So Shaft, the famous movie character, his great-great-grandparents were Broomhilda and Django. Oh, that's so so cool. So Broomhilda's last full name is Broomhilda von Shaft. Shaft. And so that's why Shaft has that name. And uh, this is something Tarantino did on purpose. Yeah, and again, what I love that Tarantino did about this film is he he actually flipped the idea that slaves weren't very well educated, and he has very eloquent and, and intelligent slaves like Django, and then Brumhilda is this German-speaking slave, and she speaks two languages, which I'm sure was incredibly rare to find in uh, South, Southern America in the mid-19th century. 
Want to hear another reference to a Tarantino movie? Let, let's do it. You don't even have to ask me. Just say it, man. <laughs> so in Kill Bill 2, when Beatrix Kiddo is buried in that grave by Bud, uh, the the tombstone on the grave says Paula Schultz. Oh, no way. So this is actually Dr. King Schultz's wife, we believe. And apparently we think that he had a wife before the events of this film and so that she was buried in that grave and Beatrix was buried in it. Yeah, and I mean, King Schultz, he's such a great character, and, and Christoph Waltz definitely deserved winning the Oscar for this. And, and just a quick little se- segue to earlier in the film, you brought up the beer scene earlier, and I think that that's such a telling scene to compare to another beer scene. So when, when Schultz pours the beer with Django, he treats him as an equal. They both have full beers. They're sitting at a table together. They're inside a bar, which Django explains to him in cut dialogue that if this would warrant enough to just get the sheriff just because of that, having a black man or a slave inside of the bar. And then, but you know, King Schultz is treating him like an equal, treating him like a human being. Whereas when Candy gives a beer to a slave, he gives a beer to one of his Mandingo fighters. And it's kind of like a sick reward. He's like, here, you enjoy that boy. And it's just like, like you earned it. Like that's why he, that's his interaction with black people and the way he treats them. He's not going to drink with them, but he'll give them something. Yeah. And Schultz, it couldn't be a, a bigger contrast from Hans Landa. And it showed Christoph Waltz's range as an actor because he won the Oscar for both both films. Uh, he won uh, supporting actor for both. And I mean, because Hans Landa is, they're both very charming and they both have like these uh, positive personas in a lot of ways. But then Hans Landa is just straight up evil and cruel and ruthless. And then... Schultz is he he is morally good and you love him and he he does right by Django and he he, he believes in justice and righteousness and so I think Christoph Waltz uh, really showed how talented he is and you could say he's easily one of the most talented actors working right now and I think he definitely deserved the Oscar although you can argue that his role in this movie it, it kind of can't it's kind of hard to accept as a supporting role because he's in so much of the movie. Especially the first half. He's in f- beginning to nearly end. Yeah. He's in so much of the movie. So I, I can understand some people might have issue with him being named the supporting actor. Um, but it is what it is. It's a really long movie. So I, I don't mind him winning the Oscar for that. Yeah, and speaking of, of that, like the, the final like, 15, 20 minutes of this film, it's kind of like an extra act to a movie that kind of already ended. Yeah, because, yeah. again, we talked about earlier how Schultz just – he creates the climax he does the climax where he kills candy even though they get from hilda and just creates kind of like a new movie and this is like a whole revenge section of the film and i love right before i love when calvin's dead and steven grabs a hold of him and, and he's weeping for the loss of this of this man because uh steven clearly loved him like a father loves a son and so uh, you it's a it's a great character moment for steven where you can like this boy it's he kind of looks at him as his own boy yeah and i think that people sort of or, over analyze the ending to this film like this this extra act of film because you, like oh the movie could have just ended why didn't they just end the movie i, th- I think what Quint- quentin tarantino did, here's doing is he's just having fun like this crazy yeah. 20 minutes of high intense violence and action this is just what he loves to do and and it's sort of you know like you said it, like i said it could technically end but i think he he wants him to enact this immense act of rage and in revenge and it sort of gives Django this mastery of, again, these oppressors to just take them all out. Because he's not fully Django yet until he does this. Yeah. So once that, once he blows the house up and he's smoking that cigarette and he's got his sunglasses on and the music is playing, then it, he, it's like, it's like uh, Batman becoming Batman or Superman finally becoming Superman. Like he's finally become Django, Django Unchained. And it's a great moment. I think that's like I think that's what makes the movie because he becomes the hero by that point. Yeah, and a lot of people question why Schultz ended up doing this. And obviously, we talked extensively about the dilemma inside the character and how he didn't want Candy to live. But also, you can think about uh, at the time the person on the harp is playing Beethoven, and, and King Schultz asked them to stop playing Beethoven because he's German. And I think that he doesn't want um, his music of his homeland to be played by such evil people. That's a great point. And something I never noticed about the very ending when Django blows up the house is the clothes he's wearing are actually the same clothes that Calvin Candy's wearing in the first scene with Calvin Candy. So I, I never put that together until like uh, repeat viewings where and I was like, oh, so Django went inside the house and stole Calvin's clothes and put them on. 
and then he that's like his final outfit. So I think that's a really neat little detail that I missed the first time seeing it. Thank you to our current top tier $10 patrons. This is the current list. So thanks to Justin Frank, Christian Reichel, Max Rosk, Charles McLaughlin, Sal Guarnera, Aaron Wadeen, Asia, Travis Ball, Riley McDonald, Nikayla Simeona and his girlfriend Caitlin, Nathan LeBlanc, Nate Moore, Michael Caranja, Logan Schroeder, Louis Thomas, Ken J, Caitlin Signorelli, Signorelli, Justin, Jorge Chavez, Jacob Kostler, Harry Roscoe, Dennis, Dennis, Dawson Jalicki Weir, Dante Christian DiLorenzo, Caleb Big Falls, Angel Mendez, Aaron McCardle. Thank you so much to you, top tier patrons. You are the best. You are the bee's knees. We love you so much. Keep tuning in. And then for as entertaining and fun and hysterical as Django Unchained can be, uh, 12 Years a Slave is just as much as it, it's meditative and uh, profound and deep and moving. And so you can really see the contrast of how you can approach stories by telling a slavery story with these two different directors. And Steve McQueen, I think he crafted uh, one of the few masterpieces of this century. I think this film, there are a lot of great slavery movies. I think a really underrated one is Amistad by Steven Spielberg with Jimon Hunsu. Absolutely fantastic. McConaughey's in it too. But I think 12 Years a Slave, I think, is the uh, ultimate film made about slavery. Um, and I think Steve McQueen uh, created a true masterpiece. Yeah, 12 Years a Slave came out in 2013, a year after Django. It won Best Picture, directed by Steve McQueen, written by John Ridley, based on the book by the slave in the film, Solomon Northup. Um, in the antebellum United States, Solomon Northup, a free black man from upstate New York, is abducted and sold into slavery. And this film, it's powerful. It will emotionally drain you. You'll be a wreck after you watch this movie. I mean, I think I, I wept for a total of 20 minutes probably throughout the film. And it's transcendent. Like you said, it's probably the, the greatest film on about slavery ever made. And it hits you like a ton of bricks and won three Oscars besides Best Picture. It won uh, Best Supporting Actress for Lupita, first feature film she ever been in, and then Best Screenplay. Um, Steve McQueen, like we said earlier, is one of our best filmmakers working today. He's a filmmaker who's interested in telling very bold, tough stories, kind of like this discomfort cinema style that he's really into. We're talking about hunger, shame. Um, Widows is more of an action take of his of his. He was a fan of that TV show Widows, so that's um, why he did that. Yeah, and then, but I mean, this is one of the most discomforting films you ever see, and, it, and he wants this to be hard to watch. And like Tarantino, he shows you these very intense scenes in Django, like of Calvin Candy sticking those dogs on the slaves and lots of violence and gore. And and Steve McQueen, he, he takes it to a whole new level. I mean, there are entire sequences where I think the first time that, that Solomon gets beaten after he's, he's abducted, it's an 87-second shot. It doesn't cut. It's him getting beaten the whole time. There's another four-plus-minute shot where he's hanging by, the, by a noose on his tippy toes trying to stay alive. And, and Steve McQueen... He balances on a tightrope of he'll show you no violence at all, and he'll actually show you beautiful imagery and these these beautiful landscapes and cinematography that it borderline looks like Terrence Malick films, and then he'll show you very intense, hard violence, and he never shows you minimal violence, or he'll, he'll imply violence sometimes, but he shows you everything that he wants to on purpose, like a lot of nudity, nudity a lot of graphic content, because he doesn't want to hide what happened. And he's a filmmaker that knows how to shoot better than most at, ever. Uh, this film was only made in 35 days. Imagine that. 35 days. Insane. With one camera. So, And then Tarantino's film Django is made in 135 days. So 100 extra days for that film. And the reason for that, like you mentioned, the long takes is McQueen has always used long takes in his, movie, in his movies, especially in Hunger. Uh, there's a 20-minute take with Fassbender. Absolutely. Oh, at the the, in, yeah. the interrogation room, right? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't it? It's just, it's just he's with the chat. Yeah, yeah it's the priest. just a chat. It's not yeah. an interrogation. And in this film, like there are a lot of long takes, uh, about close to a minute. But there are two very long takes. There's one that's almost five minutes, and then there's the, there's one that's uh, three minutes. And I think there he saved them for these moments because they are the most uh, probably I would say the the most horrific moments of the film. And the first one is Patsy being whipped by first. Uh, Solomon uh, under the order of Epps and then when Epps takes over and starts whipping her 
he shot that in five minutes without cutting. And then in the scene where Solomon is purchased as a slave is another unbroken long take that's over three minutes long. And uh, the reason why he, he holds the cameras on these two moments, I think, in particular are because they are, I think, the most impactful moments of the film uh, and the most uh, dehumanizing moments of the film. Because, yeah, someone being beaten, obviously it's dehumanizing, but I think uh, someone being sold can even be more so dehumanizing because yep. they're being purchased like a product. So Steve McQueen wisely doesn't cut away because, as, we, as we've said in, in past episodes, the the longer you hold takes without cutting, the more the audience feels as though they have been transported into the moment. Yeah, and just to stay on those two scenes that you're talking about when he's sold and then when, when uh, Lupita's character Patsy's, Patsy's yeah. being beaten, um, both of those are important scenes for the character Solomon because the first scene he's being sold and the thing with Solomon it, north up in this film and the story is he was not born into slavery he was a free man he had a life he had a family he was a, a violinist and fiddle player in uh, Saratoga New York and he was well known around in musical circles and, respected yeah he, yeah he had a good job and and he was an honest good man making a living for his family and so he he was he knew freedom his whole life and that's why it's even more devastating when it's completely stripped from him when he loses all of the liberties of his life because it's different when when we get to meet the other slaves in this film like especially Patsy where Patsy's never known freedom she's always lived in this life of cruelty and slavery so she because she's never tasted it she can never know what it feels like to lose it in a way which is I think why it's such a devastating blow obviously for Solomon but he he's completely dehumanized probably to an even extreme level as a character like Patsy, who never was humanized anyways to begin with. So to have that stripped away, it's such a horrible thing to happen to this character. And then also when you said that him beating and then watching uh, Patsy get beaten is also another dehumanizing element of his character because at this point he has a, he has a fiddle, but this is when he destroys it out of rage and anger of what he just did in his life now. Steve McQueen was very wise because he knew that the film wouldn't quite work the same if it, if it started out with, with the lead character being a slave already. He had been trying to write a script about slavery, but he was struggling to figure out the story because he knew the slave had to be he knew the character had to be free at first, and then he found uh, Solomon Northup's um, biography autobiography Twelve Years a Slave. And the reason for this is because it's for the audience. It's for us. Because we're free. We're free people. We live in America. We live in a Western civilization. So we know freedom. And so in order for us to truly relate to Solomon and to truly empathize with him, he needs to be free at first so that we can understand that he has the same freedom we have and then it's taken away. So then if we're when we're watching his freedom be taken away, it's as though we can imagine our freedoms being taken away because he was free at first so Steve McQueen knew that the character had to start out free in order for the story to really work and Chiwetel Ejiofor is a remarkable talent and we've obviously seen him in a ton of co-starring roles in in uh movies like Children of Man he's great in American Gangster Inside Man but he, he truly shines in this film as Sol Solomon Northup Chiwetel his facial expressions their entire minutes of silence and just his eyes doing the acting and his his body language doing the acting and he just emotes so much to the audience with doing so little and just just focusing on the things that his characters are going through and it's it's such a moving performance yeah it's his best performance and it showcased his talents because we hadn't seen him in a leading role before the thing with his character is he is, like we said earlier, he, he started out free. And so his character goes through the transformation of accepting slavery and accept, accepting um, his new life. But it takes a while. And um, Shiwetel is so brilliant with how he portrays his loss of his humanity bit by bit, scene by scene. And I think it, it culminates when he finally accepts who he is in this new life as a slave. Uh, it's when he sings with the with the other slaves there's yeah. that moment it's like an hour and a half in or so and and the other slaves are singing um and then he slowly begins singing too and then he fully joins in and then it's just this emotional release of him just belting out the song and it's it's the i think could be the most powerful part of the movie because there the the film starts with um hacking at the sugar cane and um the other slaves are singing 
while they're working, but Solomon's not singing. And there are a couple instances of him not joining in with the other slaves with um, their culture, especially in terms of the music, because music was very important to slaves, because he didn't feel like he was one of them. And then through the course of the film, at this moment where he finally does sing with them, I think he's finally accepting himself as part of this group. Um, It was hard to accept, and it took years. Um, I think that's why it's such a a devastating moment in the movie because he's kind of given up in a way and just accepted this life as uh, being a slave from now on. Yeah, because the fact that he had freedom in his life before, that's like kind of what he clung to to keep his humanity. And it's, it's so devastating to watch like the first way that they strip him of his humanity is to they force him to say that he's a slave they they change his name to platt they take his old clothes away so he has no connection to his past life and again he must admit that he's a slave in when he's getting put into the slavery and sold and this film it takes place really in just five parts like five acts and the first part is when he's a free man with his family and he's he's a musician um, the next part is when he's sold into slavery and it's just an intense montage of him basically being trapped and being sold and being beaten. And there's an amazing shot that Steve McQueen gets where he's in that basement um, and he's like screaming out the barred windows of this brick house building. And then the, the camera just tilts this pans up above the building and we have a, a shot of the landscape of Washington, D.C. And it's so ironic that it's illegal in D.C. at the time because it's, it's in the north and um, he's being held against his will illegally, and he's in the center, epicenter of legislation and where change happens, and it's so ironic for the character to be there. And that is such an amazing cut because it cuts from him having dinner with those two gentlemen who eventually conned him and drugged him, and they're having a nice chat, and they're, it's a, a very nice dinner, and then it cuts to him waking up in that cell room, and it's just horribly tragic. And this part of the film is... It could be the hardest to watch because Steve McQueen shows the sequence of it's it's like a long montage. It takes about 15 minutes or so of transporting these slaves onto a slave ship from within D.C. And it's in, it's an incredibly disturbing sequence. And um, if you don't know, Hans Zimmer did the music for this movie and the music in this part of the film, it's horrific. I think it's some of the most interesting music that Hans has ever done. The drums are, it's very strange br- drums and brass, and it's just disturbing, and it feels like it's a horror movie, because it is a horror movie in a lot of ways, and this is a, a horrific sequence, and I think that uh, he loves Hans Zimmer, and he asked him to do this movie, and uh, what he crafted musically for this sequence was just unbelievable, and then getting to that slave ship was just just horrible for these characters. And like Django Tarantino, he also, Steve McQueen, besides having Hans Zimmer's beautiful score, he has a lot of uh, modern music and and modern rock music, which is actually adds a great element to the, to again, uh, revitalize the genre of the slavery or or like Tarantino did with with, uh, Spaghetti Westerns. And then there are three final parts to this film after he's a free man, then he's sold into slavery, then it's Solomon on the Ford plantation, then Solomon on the Epps plantation, and then Solomon as a free man. The Ford plantation is where the character Ford played by Benedict Cumberbatch, which we talked about for a bit earlier on, is the plantation owner. And Benedict Cumberbatch's character Ford, he he has morals as a person, and he, he, he treats Solomon with humanity. He treats him, you know, like a person, although, you know, he, he is a slave owner. He did purchase him. And also, when he was buying Solomon and the, and the other slave, I can't remember her name, Elizabeth, I think, um, and he didn't want to separate the daughter from his from the mother, but uh, Paul Giamatti's character refused to sell the daughter. So uh, he, there is a sense of morality within him. Like you said, he didn't want to separate the, the two, but he did eventually. Yeah. yeah. It's the same thing we were talking about earlier. So if if you're doing something that you know is morally wrong, but it's lawful— does that make you a bad person? In my opinion, it does. It, it does make you a bad person. I mean, Ford could not own slaves. He could not purchase people. He could just hire He's workers. He's profiting off of, off of the work. Yeah, yeah, he could just hire workers and pay them wages. He could move somewhere else. He could move to the North if he doesn't agree with slavery, but he still does it. And something that happens in, actually happened in Django too with the Brill Brother where they kind of justify their actions with scripture and with the Bible. And they use the Bible 
to sort of you know justify their actions, but they also warp the meanings of, of the teachings in the Bible to, to justify what they're doing. I would say Epps does that much more than Ford. Yeah. Obviously, they're both very religious, but Epps reads scripture that he himself interprets as uh, being the Bible saying it's okay to have slaves and you're supposed to punish slaves. And there's a few scenes where he reads scripture. He is teaching, he's trying to teach it to his slaves to instill into them that he is doing right by God by being cruel to them. And so Ford obviously is very religious, but I think Epps defends his actions and defends his cruelty by saying, oh, it's written in the Bible, so that means I have to do it. Yeah, so Epps definitely takes it completely out of context for his own benefit. Yeah. But back to Ford, there's a moment in this movie, it's so profound, but it's very subtle. There's so many subtleties in this movie. But one of my favorite moments is um, after um, Solomon, who's going by Platt now, obviously, he, he solves that, that canal problem by um, building those little rafts and uh, moving them down the canals successfully and as a reward uh ford gives him a fiddle and uh at first solomon's like very grateful he's like oh thank you so much and then ford says this line he says i hope it, it brings both of us joy for many years and from ford's perspective he he's saying he thinks he's saying something nice and kind but from solomon's perspective it's like how long am i going to be here it's give bring us both joy for years that could be in, it's indefinite i could be here playing this fiddle being a slave for 50 years so i think that's a moment where uh and then you can see Chuatel's face he just turns to the camera and his face just is, is sunken down you can you see the despair in his eyes and you can see him thinking like how long am i going to be here and it's a it's a very subtle but uh, I think a huge moment in the movie. Yeah, again, Ford is not a saint. He does terrible things. He owns people just because he does have some morality. And when he gets drunk, he he questions slavery and says he doesn't believe in it and doesn't like it. But that's when he's drunk and he still owns them. And what he does, besides believing in the Bible, he hires other people to carry out the heinous acts that are involved with slavery. That's that's Paul Dano's character, John Tibby, to considers Northup's basically everything he does is like a personal affront on him. And so yeah. so Ford just hires other people to take care of the bad yeah, parts the of slavery. That yeah. doesn't make him a better person. It probably makes him a worse person because yeah. he, he won't even face it himself. Yeah, so he, I don't think that Ford obviously doesn't have the cruel nature to about him, within him, to do that stuff. But he has no problem hiring men to carry out those heinous acts. So you're absolutely right there. But then Ford does, he does save Solomon's life. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he did develop a kinship with Solomon and a respect because of how well well spoken and articulate and intelligent uh, Solomon proves himself to be time and time again. Um, and in order to save Solomon's life, he unfortunately sells him to Epps, who we end up discovering is the the main antagonist of this movie. And I he is an antagonist, but this film it doesn't have like a a rigid uh, structure or plot. Yeah, again, I, it's like a five act structure. Yeah, and this film. It, it, I think it very much reminds me of Terrence Malick movies like Tree of Life where uh, there's not like an end goal. It's just moments pieced together. And I think that's what's so important about why this movie works so well because it's not a story where there's a character and he's trying to achieve something and there's forces in his way to achieve it. Uh, I, I think it's... Um, Steve McQueen wants to show you moments that slaves went through. Like just small moments big moments whatever um to make you empathize and try to understand what it would be like to be in their shoes and i think that taking that approach to the story rather than doing a, a normal structure is why the film works so much yeah and also i think it works really well because again like you said he he brings moments of what slaves went through but also he brings a lot of of interesting scenes and in, situations of, of these plantation owners because we never really got too much of a look at them in other slave movies but we get a lot of time with these slave owners and how horrific many of them were and even how de somewhat decent if you can even say that word for a plantation owner because i mean owning people that's a horrible thing to do so i wouldn't say decent but like somewhat moral character that some of them did have um but i mean epps is just the most morally gone corrupt and in, in evil person you can think he's probably worse than calvin candy they're they're very similar 
um, in this when he gets to Epps Plantation, it's just a massive tonal shift in the film. And Michael Fla- Fassbender plays a monster in this movie. And again, he uses things like religion to justify his actions of the treatment that he does of the slaves. And and Epps is a fascinating character because he, he's a, a horrible alcoholic. And in a lot of ways, he hates himself. And I think the biggest way in which he hates himself is that I think that he's in love with Patsy, Lupita Nyong'o's character, um, and he hates that he loves her. And there's even a moment where Mistress Epps throws that that trinket at her face just out of jealousy, and in that moment she she orders Epps to to get rid of her and to sell her off. And Epps tells her tells his own wife that he would choose Patsy over her without a hesitation. And I think with with Epps is he hates slaves and he hates black people but he can't help and control his desires towards Patsy and so it's this huge moral dilemma and conflict within him that he takes out on the slaves around him yeah it seems like it's not even just Patsy he's also like kind of grooming these other slave girls the younger ones as to like maybe future Patsy roles and I mean I'm sure he's been doing this his entire life as a plantation owner and I mean maybe he was like Calvin Candy was also the son of a plantation owner and I'm glad you brought up Mistress Epps because Sarah Paulson does a phenomenal job as this character. And she's just as cruel as Epps and sometimes even worse. And she takes out all of her frustrations of her marriage out on the slaves, out on Patsy because of her jealousy like you brought up. Yeah, and within this overarching story, like I said, there are a lot of great moments. And there are a lot of moments that you wouldn't think to see that maybe other filmmakers wouldn't put into a movie. But because Steve McQueen is a black man and he understands the black experience so well he knows what to put into this movie that other filmmakers wouldn't think of and i think we're a, a, a great small moment is in the opening of the film when there are there are like 20 slaves sleeping in that in that small shack and um, solomon is lying next to this young woman and and she pretty much has him help her uh, re- reach an orgasm and solomon's face is just blank without emotion as he's doing it and then after she climaxes she just turns over and starts weeping and then Solomon still blank with his a blank face just looks away because you can see that it's a moment that shows the the humanity has just been sucked out of these people and they have been stripped of everything any kind of emotion and personality and they've they've just they're bare they're barren humans now and it's a horrible thing and it's a such a, a small but profound scene and I don't I see McQueen is such an intelligent person that he knows that scenes like that which are sprinkled throughout the entire film uh, help really tell the story and uh, translate what people like this had to go through yeah I think that that's such a great point and I think Patsy basically glorifies that entire concept you just mentioned basically being the object and plaything of Edwin Epps and his de- demented and terrifying actions on this young woman and she's kind of like the emotional core of of this this section of the film the the fourth act you can say at epps plantation which is actually it's like the, it's the longest part of the film it's over it's over an hour i think that yeah. they spent at epps plantation she's this portrait of horrible sadness uh, and she again, she asked she asked solomon to kill her yeah and again she's kind of like a mirror image to solomon because solomon again has a different experience because he's known freedom and she's never known freedom. So they both have a different experience as slaves. And her life is a living hell. And despite that, she she's a very innocent character too. And I think that's why, as an audience member, you just have so much emotion for her. Because she's so pure at heart. And she seems like such a good person. And she's such a tragic character. And I think that's why the whipping scene you could call as the climax of the movie, both for Solomon and for the story. Um, because to watch someone so innocent be brutalized like that, um, it's obviously disturbing as an audience member to see it. And then for Solomon to have to do it, I think that, like you said earlier, it was the final step to him completely being stripped of his humanity. And that's why he destroys his fiddle. And even though he is rescued shortly after this, he still had to carry out this act of destruction on another human being. And I don't think he would ever 
he could have ever fully recovered from doing something like this. And um, Solomon does try to get a letter out by one of the workers on the plantation. Played, Armsby. Yeah, played, Arms, by, Armsby. played by Garrett Hedlund, who betrays Solomon to yeah. to uh, Edwin Epps. But uh, he's able to convince Edwin Epps that the character is lying and that he, he would never do anything like that. But then he does meet Bass, played by uh, Brad Pitt, who's a Canadian contractor building a gazebo. And, and Solomon is fearful to to confide in him but he seems like a good man he seems like a moral man and you know he's not from america maybe he has different values he than, has that uh intense debate with epps yeah he sees the way that he talks to epps without fear and how they have completely contrasting opinions about slavery and i think this is what opens solomon up to the chance of reaching out confiding in bass to get a letter out to his old friends or his old community his family somehow to get someone here to prove who he truly is and that he's really a free man and and this is a best i guess you could say that it's it's a final shot for him to try to to try to get out of this horrible devastating situation he's in and unfortunately it works out for him yeah and this this ending is just absolutely devastating because uh, it cuts from that to solomon's just back working in the fields and he's with the other slaves and then the carriage rolls up with his old friend and the local sheriff and you can tell that once Solomon understands what's going on and begins um, answering questions about him himself he knows he's saved and so he just starts running to the carriage and um, Epps starts trying to pull him away and there's that confrontation but he he just goes on to the carriage and then just just seeing Solomon just hurry to that carriage because it's his it's his he's getting his life back it's it's so devastating and it makes me weep every time i see it it's hard just to talk about it and it's such an impactful moment i think it's one of the most powerful scenes i've ever seen and it's a, an unbelievable uh, climax to this film and he has to leave patsy behind which yeah. is so so sad it's so sad to watch her try to keep him there and then he, he gets on the carriage and he just watches her as she's just standing there because she's never going to be free. She's going to be living there for the rest of her life. And she actually passes out in the background. And then um, and then he's finally reunited with his family. And uh, when he's in the city and he's wearing respectable clothes again, and you see how gray his hair is and his face is so weathered from all the years of, of work and torment and cruelty he suffered, he looks like he's aged 30 years. And then he the first thing he does is he apologizes to his family for his appearance because he he feels ashamed because he still has after being a slave for so long he still has like this mentality of someone having power over them and so he, I think he kind of felt the need to apologize when he didn't have to obviously like he wasn't there for them. Yeah, it's exactly. like a responsibility to him. Yeah, so but he apologizes for his appearance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And his family has to remind him that he, that's not something he has to apologize for. And so I think they're not, they don't show it in the film, but he, Solomon's going to have to learn how to, how to become a human again and become a, 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 a man again because he's, he was completely stripped down and that's its own movie right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but McQueen wisely cut it right here because the, uh, Solomon Northup's life ended up ending in mystery. We don't know when he died or how he died. So you can't really tell the story. But um, this is a, a great ending, and McQueen ends it with this fantastic shot of his entire family embracing him, and it's so. And he just holds the camera there for like ten seconds, and then it cuts to black, and it's so simple but so impactful. And I think one of the saddest parts of the film is this ending where Solomon gets his freedom back and he gets his life back, and he goes to his family, and they're saying they're they're welcoming back into the into. Their home with open arms, obviously, but it, it kind of feels hollow in a way. It feels incomplete because this is just one person. This is one person amongst hundreds of thousands and millions of people who were slaves that that never got this chance, whether they were free at one point or not. But they didn't get their freedom. And they suffered for their entire lives, and so that's why, for me, though powerful the ending is, it just kind of feels unfulfilled for me because. It's, again, just one person out of millions. Yeah, that's why I, I weep when I see this movie because you can just imagine this is just one experience of so many. And he got away, and the vast majority never did. 
And it's just a, a great tragedy of, of humankind, the idea of slavery and uh, slavery over other people. It's just a, the, the greatest stain on humanity, uh, uh, on humans' existence. And um, I think movies like this remind us about how important uh, it is to, uh, be in a com- to be in a community and to accept one another and, and to treat each other and look at each other as equals. Yeah, slavery is a curse on this planet and humanity that's existed for thousands of years. And it's it's so sad to think of how recent it just ended in a way. Um, and it, it, The value of a human life pre-Civil War in America, it will make you sick to your stomach how much a person costs. In the movie, Ford purchased Solomon Northup and Eliza for $1,000 and $700 respectively, calculating with inflation from 1841 to when the movie came out in, I think, 2013. The equivalent dollar amount would be $27,000 and $19,000. That's all it costs to buy a person pre-Civil War. It's horrible. It's unbelievable. Before filming their their very brutal scenes together, uh, Lupita Nyong'o and Michael Fassbender would perform a ritual that they called making nice, and according to Lupita... They wouldn't say much to each other. They would just look at each other in the eye, grasping hands. Their characters were in such opposition, but as actors, they needed to, they needed each other to be able to go the distance and give the performances what they needed to. Yeah, understandable. Sarah Paulson was hired for the job because Steve McQueen's own daughter told him to hire her after viewing her audition tape because she thought Sarah Paulson was very scary. <laughs> a little kid. Well, I mean, she's an American horror story for a reason. She's yeah. a great uh, horror actor. Yeah. That's it for our slavery on film episode with Django Unchained and 12 Years a Slave, two phenomenal films. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, everyone.